Hey everybody, welcome to Fishtory. We are on episode 86 already, so thanks for making that happen. Thanks for supporting the channel and for staying curious. Also, thank you to Jess on the Aquatic Morning Show for coming up with the great idea for this little segment and uh, pushing me to keep doing it. Alright guys, so I hope everybody has had a good weekend. I hope the long weekend's still going on if you're in the States and get to enjoy that. Well, our first story of the week has to do with eDNA, which we knew would be coming up over and over again once we heard about the whole uh, genesis of eDNA. It's pretty cool stuff. Essentially, you take a small sample of water or soil, but essentially they, they turn it into a slurry or a mix if it's something other than uh, other than in the water. So even if it were air, for instance, they would still put it into water, mix it around, and then sample that uh, in most processes they've been doing of it. But thanks to eDNA, you can literally test a little vial of water or a water bottle is even better and look through it and find any single cell, any strand of DNA. It just takes one cell being in there. And usually if you're in a stream or in nature somewhere, there's just cells all over the place. It's like uh, it's like when you turn on one of those black lights in a hotel room and it just glows like on the CSI shows. Well, cells are pretty much that way as far as just needing one or two or a few skin cells or scales or whatever it may be from an animal in the environment. So as of May 25th, there is some brand new research out of the University of Hong Kong, and uh, they've done some really interesting research, which is in the wet markets of China. They went to Shenzhen, Guangzhou and uh, also Hong Kong proper, the city, and they used eDNA to sample the runoff drains in their wet markets. Now you might remember their wet markets because uh, they kind of started, uh, or at least that was the supposed start point. You can, I, different people believe different things, but in any case, it spread in a wet market, which essentially is a market that gets hosed down and is full of fish guts and animal blood and all sorts of nasty stuff because it's where you go get your fresh, fresh produce in Southeast Asia and, okay, most of Asia, not even just Southeast Asia, but anywhere in East Asia. So that whole process of hosing down the stalls means that most of these markets have a drain, hence the name wet markets. So researchers decided to actually test that water and see what species were there. And with over a hundred banned species by the Chinese government, they were able to find 19 different banned species at one fish market. And so it's pretty amazing what they've been able to do with eDNA. I mean, the the other thing that's really amazing about using eDNA is that they've been able to just look using that sampling technique, find whatever the fish is that's endangered or that is not allowed to be bought and sold, and then they are able to detect it even without having the whole fish or the taxonomy of the fish being known. So now people like border agents and things in the near future will be able to have a test kit uh, probably within the next 10 years where you can actually just run a sample through a little handheld device. Right now they're bigger than that. Uh, but probably will be able to shrink that technology and you won't need to know what every fish looks like. You won't need to know um, what it looks like at what age, if it's butchered, what fish it used to be. How are you supposed to know what fillet of fish it is? So that's the amazing part about eDNA is the DNA doesn't really lie. Well, sometimes it does when it's a closely related species and you only get a partial sample, but it, that's for another video. In anyways, it's a good way though to get a grip or a grasp on what's going on at a given spot that is selling wildlife in this way. They might also be able to use this all sorts of different places, airports and things like that, and someday have it able to 
sound an alarm if you uh, screen, if it screens something like, uh, you know, an endangered panda or eggs of an arowana fish or something like that. So it's kind of an interesting uh, concept. The only thing that I don't like is that, uh, you know, we've been talking about that species ban that was going into, that could be going into effect if the Lacey Act, uh, amendment gets overturned and uh, and and modified and so when I was saying how could they ever teach someone to learn all 23,000 species this is actually a solution to that to some degree uh, or at least enough that then they could search the taxonomy or the pictures and try to compare once they have the Latin name based on that DNA However, that would also require a bunch of research and a, uh, and a depository of those specific types of DNA. Because if you haven't seen it before, uh, you may know it's in a family of some sort, but you may not know the species. So uh, you would know what it has in common with other species and that it's related in some way, but you won't know the exact species. So I thought this was uh, really cool, minus that little part for if the Lacey Act amendments were to get... Uh, enacted, but as long as they don't, <laughs> it's awesome technology, and I am excited for the day when you can just stick a little test tube, like the API test liquid test strips, or test tubes, and uh, put one in the uh, lake or river you're at, and test and see every single fish that's living in there, most likely. Really cool technology, and putting it to good use, especially in an area that's notorious for um, in specifically these researchers were able to then you know they test the water they went through the stalls and then they were able to see the fish even when butchered just by knowing okay well we're looking for these species so it has this kind of scale and it's this color meat and it's yay big or whatever and they were able to find a grouper species two uh chinese or or asian sea brims that are are uh, critically endangered, several eels and lampreys that were also critically endangered, and also the Okinawan sea brim, which is also very endangered. So pretty cool technology. They are hoping that the governments of the world will start employing it in ways in order to stop this bycatch and stop this black market catch that goes on, especially in uh, Southeast Asia and uh, really any major metropolitan area in the world there's potential for those black markets uh all right guys that's what we have for today's episode i hope you guys have a great day if you've got the day off awesome i'll be streaming later and uh if not uh well that sucks so have a good one either way talk to you later back to you jess bye Hey, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with episode 87 of Fishery. And uh, this one is a little interesting. It might be something you already know, though, right? Okay. So they detected drugs in the waters off Florida. Pretty surprising, huh? Oh. No? You're not surprised? Well, okay. So maybe it's not that big of a surprise that there are all sorts of drugs floating in the water off Florida. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's the retirement capital of the of the country, and uh, it's also uh, a big entry point for illegal... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just call them drugs. So uh, they decided, a bunch of uh, researchers uh, with an institute called the uh, FIU and Bonefish... Tarpon Trust, the BTT, uh, they decided to uh, check the waters off the Florida coasts, the salt water, uh, and they had seen that there was contamination in the Everglades of pharmaceuticals and industrial chemicals and things, and some of them, like the hormones and uh, the statins, the blood thinners and blood heart, heart um, medications and blood pressure medications, uh, could have some real effects, in, and as well as, you know, the birth controls and things like that, which goes back to estrogen, uh, or illegal steroids, anabolic, or testosterone, things like that can have a big influence. They can change the the hatch ratio uh, from male to female. They can cause uh, the frogs to turn gay, um, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, I shouldn't make light of it, but uh, they have found... Uh, Mostly, this study focused off Biscayne Bay 
and the Florida Keys, and uh, it it was uh, overseen by the Coastal Fisheries uh, Department, and they said that uh, they found a whole lot of different medications in the water. So uh, it says that uh, the head of this study's name is Jim McDuffie. Uh, he's the president and CEO of the BTT. Uh, he said that pharmaceuticals are, are often overlooked and uh, it's not a dimension of water quality that's even uh, tested for in a lot of parts of the country or world for that matter. So the presence of uh, South Florida uh, waters and in turn the bigger news is of course that a lot of the fish we eat in fact had measurable levels of these uh, contaminants and it poses a significant threat to the fisheries in the fish health as well as to humans in the long run uh, some of these things have unknown consequences others have known consequences that aren't that good uh, and uh, you know things like lithium you you don't want that or mercury or lead uh, which those aren't necessarily pharmaceuticals other than the lithium but you don't want those adding up in your bloodstream if you're eating you know uh, rich fatty meats of a uh, apex predator type fish in the water like you know a, a tuna or a sailfin or a swordfin um, or swordfish or something like that so you know the recreational saltwater fishery uh, in Florida alone has a 9.2 billion dollar industry and uh, if you count the agricultural and uh, uh, aquacultural industry, that's another $1.2 billion. So we've got almost $11.5 billion directly supported by these fish and the eating of these fish. That's not even counting like the restaurants. That's counting the sales of the meat. That's counting charter fisher fishing trips uh, and the hatcheries themselves buying and selling. Uh, and it says that in Florida alone, 88,500 jobs, that's a low estimate, uh, rely on these fish. So it's important for them to be safe and edible. Uh, so the study began in 2018, and scientists with the BTT Research Associates Partnership teamed up with uh, Sweden's Umia University and the University of Aquacultural and Agricultural Sciences uh, and they've sampled 93 fish in South Florida, finding an average of seven pharmaceuticals per fish and a whopping 17 pharmaceuticals in a single bone fish that they sampled. Uh, the list includes blood pressure medications, as I said, antidepressants, prostate treatments, chemo medication, um, uh, everything from antibiotics to pain relievers and uh, they also found that uh, the bonefish prey such as crabs, shrimp, fish, crayfish and even small uh, smaller uh, micro crustaceans and cephalopods that they are all vulnerable to uh, these same chemicals and that it's building up in the uh, bioweb. So it's important that we uh, think about this and that we think about how we could filter this out uh, because a lot of it's coming from the waste of us just excreting it when we use the restroom and then that not being treated properly and be going out to sea. But also people are putting their medications down the drain and uh, also industrial uses of these things when they're, when they're creating them for the pharmaceutical industry. They're not being disposed of properly um, in the sense that there may not be regulations against it, may be able to wash out into the ocean, but that probably shouldn't be the case anymore. So, uh, kind of depressing news there, uh, but at least the fish might be able to cure your depression uh, if it bums you out. So, uh, I will talk to you next time. Back to you, Jess. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Alexander Williamson with Fishery, and uh, today we're going to be talking about an interesting twist in the new... Uh, the new problem that the aquarium hobby has been fi facing, which is that uh, the Competes Act or Compete Act uh, that is trying to get through, went through the House already, it's trying to get through the Senate, 
Uh, and it has lots to do with jobs and uh, not outsourcing stuff to China. It's bipartisan, pretty well liked. It is a Democrat bill um, in theory, but then there's uh, 600 different projects that have been added in. One of those little pet projects or laws or changes to laws is uh, Marco Rubio has inserted a uh, a little uh, a little just a little uh, six page memo essentially that would amend the Lacey Act, which controls what is allowed to be imported and exported in terms of uh, well, originally it's supposed to be um, byproducts of animals, but now they are talking about changing it to animals, and so. The idea is essentially ban everything unless it was imported, and then this is the problem, the vagueness, within minimum quantities in the last year, which nobody knows what that means. It doesn't clear it up, and the uh, Secretary of the Interior is the one to determine that. So you've probably heard all of this, but what's interesting is that there is a new ally actually kind of uh, several and huge allies that are way bigger than uh, us fish hobbyists uh, or reptile hobbyists or even pet owners, honestly, uh, that want this thing squashed. They want it cut. They want it out. And that is the pharmaceutical industry. So unexpectedly, uh, in a weird way, maybe, maybe someone expected, I didn't, uh, the pharmaceutical industry tests on animals and a whole lot of their tests are on fish, you know, different small mammals, different reptiles or birds even too. But oftentimes it's on things like fruit flies, fish, and all of that stuff is considered gonna it's all up for being banned uh unless specifically noted otherwise and a lot of research is done on very specific um species or species that have been modified and the law doesn't clarify if it's been modified like a gmo is it an animal is it a drug like glowfish are considered a supplement or a drug and the fda is who had to approve them uh for import or breeding and so forth in our country so beyond being really unclear uh it impacts a lot of industries that maybe we didn't think about right off the 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 bat so of course if you are a pet enthusiast a pet owner an aquarist you should check out pjack p-i-j-a-c dot org if you're in canada it's pjack uh, Canada.org, and they've got it for a number of countries around the world, but essentially uh, they've been lobbying to try to get rid of this. Now, altogether, we have probably seen a few million dollars put into their campaign from uh, different resources in the pet and fish and reptile and bird and um, insect-loving uh, companies that benefit uh, off of the the pet trade, essentially. Well, now we've got the big boys in here. We've got a 50 billion RX a year. That's 50 billion prescriptions a year are filled in the U.S. Every single one of those prescriptions was tested on animals before it was tested on humans. And so medical testing and things that we don't necessarily think about, but almost everything like hair shampoo doesn't necessarily need to be tested on animals in cruel ways anymore. Now they have a lot of different protocols, but it doesn't matter. They still need to get those animals to do the testing. And I'm not saying all testing is cruelty free. There still is some really gnarly things that happen. And for medical research, it's inevitable that there's going to be some not so pleasant things that happen. And that's a topic for a different time. But uh, this is a huge industry with big lawyers and lobbyists that are coming to bat for uh, the topic. So I went and looked it up uh, when I was thinking about this, when it was mentioned in passing. You know, P. Jack had mentioned in an article that uh, the pharmaceutical industry was also concerned that they would limit access to things like, you know, zebrafish, rice fish, uh, the mummy chug 
or Mamachug minnow, which is uh, the one that went to space. Like, we use weird animals for science because of very specialized and specific features they have. And uh, a lot of times, that's not going to be something that's in the pet trade. And so these industries that do research on medical technology, uh, even defense contractors who are studying animals for biomimicry and things, they're saying we don't want this banned or we need an exception and just to show you guys the pet industry did about uh 12 million if you count cats and dogs uh dollars of lobbying fund raising uh in the last year so far this year alone the pharmaceutical industry has spent 263 million dollars on lobbying and in fact uh this year as of may 15th that's when that number's from uh beyond spending 263 million dollars trying to sway uh our representative uh democracy uh <laughs> they have also employed three lobbyists for every member of congress so house and senate combined so that's like you know 500 or whatever and another uh uh 100 and <laughs> so what we're looking at like six like, like 1800 or 1500 people that are employed just to influence things and that doesn't count hair products, soap, um, you know, different household chemicals and items, uh, Dow chemical and, and things like that that want to test these products, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's kind of ironic, you know, a lot of pet owners would be very upset that these things are being tested on pets. Yet, the whole reason this thing may not go through may be because of those people that we don't necessarily uh, align with so i guess it is true that the enemy of my enemy is my friend so we're gonna have to go with that right for right now if you want to see more about who is lobbying for who who's given what contributions and political campaign donations go to opensecrets.org it's a great source uh, for info and it just blows your mind sometimes who's giving how much money to what and oftentimes it's both sides of the issue that are getting paid off by one entity. So either way, they're going to win. Uh, it's, it's unreal how business gets done here, uh, especially if you're in the European Union. You'd probably get a kick out of it because uh, the ethics laws there are very different from the ones here. In any case, uh, maybe this is hope that that won't go through uh, and nothing will happen. Uh, with that Lacey Act Amendment. Fingers crossed, and uh, fingers crossed that the, the cruel treatment of animals also stops soon. All right, guys, I'll talk to you later, one battle at a time. See you later. Back to you, Jess. Bye. Hey, you guys made it to the end of the week, and I made it to the end of the list of stories that I wrote and then put on my uh, notepad. <laughs> so... Today, episode number 89 is going to be called Animal Intelligence Placed on a Periodic Table of Intelligence. So I thought this story was kind of interesting, and it doesn't strictly relate to fish or um, only aquarium uh, creatures. But in the article and in the research that's being done, uh, this big old pro overarching project... Um, it includes a ton of animals in our aquarium. Not just that, it includes organisms in our aquarium. And what's going on is a group of scientists are trying to quantify and list out all the types of intelligence. So in the 1950s and 60s, anthropologists, biologists, we used to think, you know, humans are so special because we're the only animal that makes tools. Well, then Jane Goodall and the chimpanzees they make tools then dolphins they make tools then crows and ravens make tools uh, okay every friggin animal seems to make tools <laughs> uh, so then we said well it's because of language well then we find other animals with language or uh, great apes that can do sign language so what they want to do is they want to create just like there is a 
periodic table of elements, they want to create a table that has all the way down from the most basic, which would be like um, a slime mold saying, or a mushroom saying, hey, there's more nitrogen in the ground over there, and sending a signal that then encourages growth towards that direction to the mushroom next door or to the to the fruiting body next door and through the mycelium and hyphae below so that would be like very basic and they would put you know that whatever they want to call that type of logic or intelligence or uh if a then b just very simple not abstract thinking or even thinking through a, a brain at all and then you know it goes up to a dog playing fetch or to um it just works its way up and they want to organize it and see what they can learn when we step back and give animals credit and so are extraordinarily diverse and uh and this new attempt to categorize them uh has aims to reveal the distinct nature of intelligence in everything from dolphins to bees and yes us so if you've ever concluded that intelligence is in short supply in the modern world, perhaps you are looking in the wrong place. Humanity may be suffering from collective stupidity, but there are still plenty of smarts to be found elsewhere in the animal world. Uh, you will be familiar with the clever antics of the whales and dolphins and chimpanzees and things like that that I mentioned. But what about wasps and bees? Did you know that they dance to communicate where the pollen and food and goodies are? Well, they do. And that they can recognize human faces and then communicate. Yeah, that's the human, as long as they're within sight range. They can give an affirmative response chemically. That's the one to sting. That's why wasps can follow you and keep stinging you. Uh, so that's a type of intelligence, whether or not it's chemical or extinct, instinctual, that's not the point of this. This is to look at all forms of intelligence and try to see what we can gather and gain by understanding that. Um, or the fact that many aquarium fish can, uh, can actually see through the tank, recognize faces, and they know when a certain face is the one that comes to feed them, and they'll come up to the glass and be friendly. Whereas if another person is the one who's known to chase them and pull them out of that tank, they will hide. That's common in many different species of fish. But uh, what about crabs? Yeah, crabs have intelligence too. Uh, they like to hide in stinging sea anemones and defend themselves against predators, just like the the cute little Finding Nemo clownfish uh, do. But who would have thought that maybe a crab was that clever? I don't know. I don't really think much about crabs, period. Uh, they kind of creep me out, I'm not going to lie. Except the pretty ones, like the little vampire crabs and stuff. Those are great. Uh, but they're hard questions to answer. And uh, in nature, it's really tricky because there's a lot of different forms of intelligence and a lot of different forms of life forms. And if they don't speak our language and communicate in our way of communicating, uh, a lot of times we've just written them off until very, very recently. Um, and I say that as a Western uh, way of thinking because there are a lot of indigenous groups that definitely thought animals were... Uh, deities or spirits that could teach them things and things like that. But in Western science, we've kind of discredited them or poo-pooed them for a long time. So they're calling this a radical new idea. They want to create a periodic table of intelligence akin to the one used to categorize chemicals in the periodic table of elements. And in New Scientist magazine, they have a whole long uh, article that goes more into how it's organized and you can pay the money and read it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, basically uh, I can't share the, the charts and things with you because uh, they charge you like a couple hundred bucks to publish it in your uh, publication. And uh, yeah, so unfortunately can't quite swing that one yet as the channel. But uh, you can go there and I think you can get free access for like 
three articles or something. So there's links for all my subscribers, as always. Uh, there'll be links on my community page to all the info, my sources, and the, the, the script slash outline of all these videos. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in and watching. I hope you have a great week and a great weekend now that we're at the end of the week, uh, if this video is playing when I think it will be. Uh, but regardless, thanks for tuning in. Always good to have you. Talk to you guys later. And back to you, Jess. I'm still here. Did she click off? I think she... She's got it now. Alright, bye guys.